Storytelling is about the human race in general. A human race, for whatever reason, was born with a soul. And the only thing that feeds that soul, as far as I'm concerned, is story, because we are all stories. If you want soul food, go out and find a story. Tell a story, be a story, you are a story. What else is that? So there was a little village in a faraway land, um, a land called Gloucestershire. And in this village, there was this great, beautiful little meadow. Um, and it was full of fairy rings. And that was because the fairies loved to come and dance there on full moon nights. And they'd come out from the wild wood and they'd dance in these great circles and leave the fairy rings as a, as a reminder to the villagers that they'd been there. For centuries this field was undisturbed, unploughed, until uh, one day a farmer drove past this little field and looked at it. While all the other fields around about were covered in corn, this field was green as, um, well, as green could be. And so, because he was not a particularly nice farmer, he was filled with a sense of frustration at the laziness and waste of this piece of, piece of, piece of grass um, covered in you know, buttercups and daisies and clover and other lovely things and was so infuriated by it that he resolved to go and fix this problem immediately so he drove off to the village hall um, and immediately went to the parish clerk and bought the land outright and the, uh, because of all the mysterious things that were reputed to go on with this field the parish was quite glad to be rid of it so the farmer with the deeds in hand he went straight back to his farmyard got his tractor with the, with the plough on the back and ploughed this field from one end to the other. That night, a wind blew up from the wild wood and blew across towards the field. And a couple of little clods of earth, really just tiny specks really, were caught up in it and were blown across the surface, rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling. And as they rolled, they got bigger and bigger and bigger until they were as big as tar barrels. And then they reached the road and as they, when they hit the road, the clods of earth started falling from their sides until eventually these figures emerged from the earth and they were two handsome young men and they made straight for the farm. And in the farmyard they found the handsome son and the handsome daughter of the farmer of which he was very proud because they were beautiful. And uh, the two men from the field came up and started chatting up the daughter and the son. One whose hair was brown as chocolate went up to the farmer's son and complimented him on his, on his, on his pretty blue eyes and uh, chatted to him as he repaired the tractor which had just mown the field. And the other, whose hair was as gold as the summer sun, was chatting to the girl and complimented her on her pretty red dress and her pretty red lips and her pretty red hair. So they sat and they chatted and they, and they, and they wooed and they did as, as young lovers tend to do and they headed off into the distance. And the farmer's wife saw them go and was quite pleased that her two children had attracted the attention of two such handsome, illustrious looking men. So when the farmer returned from market to realise that both his children had gone and these two mysterious young men had spirited them off, he suddenly remembered all the old tales and stories that he'd heard about the field and heard about the fair folk. And so he got in his, he got in his Land Rover and he drove off. And as he did so, he noticed along the road there were these little marks of muddy boot prints. And uh, he got to the field, but all that was left were two little mounds of earth in the, right in the middle where the dancing lawn had been and his daughter's dress hanging from the hedge. Now, people might say that this, you know, this was folklore, but 
one thing that has always been said since then in that little village is that that field, ever since that point, was covered in pretty, the prettiest blue cornflowers that you ever saw with the prettiest red poppies. And the grass that grew there was as gold as the summer sun and the ground was as brown as the mouths of rivers. So, which, all, which always goes to show, I suppose, that even if the Fae take you away, you're never gone for good. Even if you're gone forever. A bard is someone who is able to work with their creativity, who tells stories, who sings. In the old days, a bard was somebody who knew the genealogy of the tribes. They held the memory of the tribe. Nowadays, we use it in a broader sense to mean someone who works with the arts, if you like. When I was really young, um, I met the old chief druid, and he presented a vision to me of the landscape of Britain being magical with stone circles and sacred groves and wonderful magical spots. That was the first thing, I think, that, that inspired my interest and inspired me. In the early years, I suppose, what I was really studying was the old stories, the Ogham, which is the tree language of the Druids, um, learning about the old sites and about the festivals, the eight seasonal festivals, the solstices, the equinoxes and so on. Later on, you know, I studied psychology and psychotherapy, and I became really interested in the way you could work with all this as a form of therapy, as a kind of cultural therapy, if you like. And I realized that one could also use it as a way of healing at a soul level, at a psychological level, if you like. That the more I worked with Druidry, with the old ceremonies, the old stories and legends, the more complete and whole I felt, and the more grounded and the more comfortable I felt in my, in my culture and in my world. And so over the years, that's become a large part of what we do in the order, is it's educational at that level, but it's also therapeutic. I guess I started kind of writing stories when I was really little. My mum has got this, you know, as mums do, they preserve these sort of things that you did when you were knee high to a grasshopper. And uh, yeah, it's this story about this island that I made up, which was kind of, uh, I can't remember what it was called now, uh, but it was just, you know, this little island. I think it might have been just called the island. And it was populated with all my favorite animals and they all had little adventures together. And I actually made it out of, um, out of cardboard and trees made, made from paper and I kind of stuck it all together and it made it, it's kind of my own equivalent of a sort of Chelsea Island, you know, set. And, and, and it just kind of started from that, actually, you know, really liking the ability to create your own world and create something, you know, there's this wonderful f um, phrase that Tolkien uses called, um, I, think, I think it's Tolkien, called, um, called sub-creation, the idea that you kind of create something in, 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 in homage to the, in homage to the world around you, that it's something you feel is wonderful and precious that you want to replicate and you do so, it's always been something that has um, attracted me and I've always felt this sense of magic behind and within absolutely everything I experience. And so I guess this is just my way of kind of acting that out and um, expressing that creatively um, is certainly something that is kind of intrinsic to my uh, bardic practice. Well, my name is Stephanie Hill Smith, um, and I come and tell stories at Wickham Tales once a month. And apart from that, I am a human being and a mother and all the other things that involved with that. So that's who I am. It's gone. I had What's done my happened? storytelling course no, at Emerson out. College, what am I gonna do? and I'd been practicing storytelling at Southampton Story Club for about a year and a half. And I kept saying to myself, why hasn't Winchester got a story club? Why hasn't Winchester got a story club? And then I suddenly thought, okay, I'll start one. And so that's what I did. I started in the uh, September of that year and I got to know Suzanne about the same time and we sort of sat and chatted because we felt that Winchester needed storytelling. That's, that's really how we did it. A lot of people that are looking for 
arts related or community um, activities tend to congregate here. Um, we saw the cellar down here, we just knew it would be a wonderful space um, to take a step outside of the hurly burly of life and uh, once a month and, and spend time together talking and telling stories. So. Hmm. I wasn't actually looking for a story club as such. I had been trawling the net because I felt creatively I wanted to do something, but I didn't know what it was. And in the in the process of doing that, I came across Emerson College that did courses for storytelling. And as soon as I read that, I was like, oh, that's interesting. And somehow I found myself booked onto a weekend course there. <laughs> and having done that, I then started looking on the web for, for more information about it. And up popped this club in Winchester and I thought hmm, okay I'll go along and I'll have a little look at that so I came along in September 2012 um, and really as soon as I walked in the door it's got such a lovely comforting feel and when I came down here and it's so it's got such a you know such atmosphere down there that although I knew nothing about storytelling at that point it kind of welcomed me into it and uh, everything else that's happened since then is Another story, really. <laughs> On one hand, the proliferation of social media has encouraged people to kind of stay at home and use computers as, an, as a medium for communication. Uh, where once they would have happily, you know, gone around to someone's house or maybe even phoned them, you know, but there would have been a, a slightly more immediate level to the, communica to the communication involved. I think people are becoming more individualised and more isolated. I've certainly found that things like YouTube um, and things like Amazon, even though they've been quite damaging for conventional uh, filmmakers and publishers, They've, they've kind of made, made the traditional kind of studio model unsustainable. What they have done is they've allowed content makers off with much you know, more limited resources, limited means, to make their stories, their tales, their accounts of life um, available to a much broader audience um, with much greater ease than they could ever manage if they were just you know, a, a one-man band kind of going out and telling stories. The difficulty as with all these things, is that it's very easy for something like YouTube to get um, manipulated by kind of kind of capitalist interests, I suppose you could call it, you know, if you wanted to take a Marxist view, and to say, well, you know, when you look at things like YouTube, you can see how they're already being used primarily as a way of circulating, you know, clips from Family Guy rather than people's original content. Um, and I think that's, you know, potentially not using the medium to its full advantage, because I think social media could be used to actually really revive and really empower people to tell their stories and to share their creativity but it's not necessarily going to be that way there's no guarantees the reason why so many people are interested in druidry and bardistry and in uh, storytelling uh, now why there's a real renaissance in it is because i think people have got tired of the hollywoodization of culture if you like where everything is sort of bled of any kind of depth or subtlety and um, people, once you've experienced some really good storytelling, you've been out and you've experienced what oral culture is like in that way, then, then you really know the difference. What happens as well in live entertainment is you have the possibility for what's called Arwen, but what we call in Druidry Arwen which is the, the magic. You know when you go to a, to a li live entertainment and you might say to a friend afterwards, that was magic. And you sort of mean it, there was something came into the room. This person seemed to conjure up something that wasn't present at the beginning of the evening. And in Druidry, we, we believe that that is a real power that you can conjure up. And we call it Arwen, which is inspiration or the blessings of the gods. If everything can be recorded, we can avoid the awareness of the fact of transience, of the fact that some things only exist for a moment and then, and then they've gone. So the thing about the oral culture is that when you're sitting listening to some amazing conversation with friends or 
uh, uh, it's poetry or storytelling. It's only going to happen then, and as soon as it's over, you will never be able to reproduce it. Even if you get the same audience together in the same venue with the same performer, it's going to be different. And that's its beauty, but also there's a sadness in that as well. And so there's a way in which those of us who are, uh, you know, who've grown up with the ability to record everything, so we've got our iPhones, so we can keep snapping away. At one level, this is very unconscious, but at one level what's happening is we're avoiding the reality of transience and ultimately of death. But once you can come to terms with death, once you can come to terms with the strange nature of life, that its beauty lies in the fact that it is passing and it can't be recaptured, then it starts to reveal its beauty and its depth. You get more of the real person when you're dealing with a human being, when you're talking, when you're, when you're telling a story to someone and you're listening and you're receiving every part of who they are face to face in whatever the way they are. I mean, they might have come to the story club telling, feeling really sad and that's bound to affect the way they tell the story. It's almost as if television and computers are giving you visions on a plate so here is the story, these are the pictures that go with it. You don't have to do any work at all to create the stories in your head. You don't have to create any pictures in your head because it's all done for you. And sometimes when something goes wrong or there's a loud noise or mm. people clumping up and down our stairs, yeah, that um, it kind of, we laugh it breaks the moment but then we pick back up or sometimes the sound effects seem to come just at the right moment when mm. a prince is storming down the, the steps of the castle mm. or down clumping comes somebody and sometimes it's those things that wouldn't or couldn't be repeated if you tried um, mm. that make the experience really alive and memorable. Yes, a storyteller without an audience is a, is, is a difficult place to be mm. as you said when you're practicing it's it's hard, you're almost, I, I end up talking to the trees if I go for a walk <laughs> I, and I tell a story to a tree because otherwise I've got no one to focus on, nothing to focus on. Well, I'm not certain it's technology that's kind of killed the storytelling mm. thing because there seems to be a large gulf in time between when communities at the end of the day would have gathered around at some central mm. place and sat and told stories or sat and discussed their day to where we are now. It, you know, within my memory, I don't remember that happening when I was a child mm. when we didn't have anywhere near the technology we got now. So there's, historically, there's a large gulf somewhere, mm. I think, where storytelling's kind of got lost in the ethos of every, everyday life. Well, of course, at first sight, you would think there would be nothing more out of place than druids and bards and the whole idea. It just seems hopelessly anachronistic and either romantic or silly, depending on your point of view. But in a strange way, it's an absolute corrective, if you like, or an antidote to the kind of depersonalised, alienated, mechanical world that we've started to create around us. And it's part of that whole movement towards nature, towards really understanding the past not as something that's dead and gone, but is still living and available to us, and that opens us to our heritage as well. As, as, as our cl culture and our lives become more globalised, uh, the danger is that we become alienated. So we feel as if we're just tiny cogs in some huge machine. What the order does is it offers a home, if you like, for people to gather, a hearth where pe which people can gather around. And sometimes we literally offer a hearth. So in the camps that we have, we'll have a, a fire burning. And, you know, it's the, this deeply primal and lovely feeling of gathering around a fire and listening, listening to stories, playing music, uh, sharing uh, our lives together and there's something primal and wonderful about that sense of connection and, and warmth and sometimes the hearth is virtual so we have virtual hearths that people gather in on the message boards on the internet in forums some of them are private forums for members only 
summer forums that open to the public as well. And then there are groups all over the world that, 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 that for people in the order, they come together, sometimes just two, three, four people, sometimes 20, 30 people, and they celebrate the festivals together, they meet regularly. And again, they provide that warmth and sense of connection. When you experience life, it's a, it's a succession of events that occur. And if you believe that life is fundamentally meaningless and that you're a victim of circumstance, then, then your life will carry on feeling meaningless and feeling, making you feel like a victim. If you believe in the power of story and you understand the fact that you can look at the events of your life and create meaning out of it, then not only does it serve the, the function of actually making you feel happier, uh, it also means that you're in a place to be more helpful to other people because you ha have a sense of meaning and a sense of purpose. People will be surprised the number of festivals and events mm. and clubs that are springing up. Um, the experience of being in a crowd of sort of 800 people camping on a field whilst going down, backwards and forwards between story performances is quite amazing. Um, one of the hurdles I think is because people have this idea that storytelling is primarily for children and um, it's um, then you say well you can tell adult stories and then people might expect something a little bluer <laughs> but really um, we're all made of stories mm -hmm. we consume stories in lots of different ways in mm -hmm. technology but I think we need to get back to the roots of telling stories and valuing human to human con conversation oral tradition is, is is ages eons old it's what started with it with the human race in every country in the world you will find storytellers who travel from place to place, bringing their history with them and taking their history to the next place. That's what the African griot does. He brings their laws and their traditions around the whole country. Um, the Native American Indians have storytellers. The Americans have storytellers. It's carrying the stories of your particular world to the people who matter to you. And that's what we do. And that's what everybody can do. Because as you very rightly said, we are stories in ourselves. Everything we do in every moment of our lives is a story. So how can it possibly be a dying art? And the more you tell stories, the more you become a storyteller. There is no one person that is not a storyteller. People can say to me, oh, I'm not visual, I can't possibly be a storyteller. Well, actually, if you worry, then you're bound to be an imaginative person because you're imagining all the worst. <laughs> so why not imagine the best? Why not imagine dragons and fairies and witches and cats, pots, of gold, pots yeah. of gold and magical things which really make you feel bloody good? Well, they do to me anyway. Mm. It's those kind of things that when you're having a bad day, making up a story really takes you to another place. And that's a great way of living. I can't think of any reason why not. And that's the joy of storytelling. You can wrap something difficult up in, in something really beautiful. And it just takes... It's like drawing the poison out of a wound, mm -hmm. you know? It, it heals it and it makes it better. And that's a lot of the power of storytelling. And I don't see why in the future that shouldn't be become greater and greater. Storytelling is, is there and has been there through, throughout history mm -hmm. and it needs to continue because otherwise our souls will suffer. Mm -hmm. That's what I feel. There was a time when uh, everyone could be an artist, everyone who made anything could make it beautiful and unique and could afford to be creative with it because there was no way of making anything quicker and in a, in a kind of a batch process that just made them all standardised. There's been a flourishing of you know, mass produced both cultural products and practical products and where things are practical often they've lost some of their aesthetic accomplishment. You don't see the degree of care going into the making of a spoon in this day and age that you would have done perhaps you know, decades past. Uh, or centuries past. So you've got uh, one designer who makes one spoon, one, one spoon design, and that is then copied for 
hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of homes. So that one, so only one person's bardistry is really being expressed in in those hundreds, millions of homes in terms of that spoon. Um, whereas in you know the medieval period, practically every village would have had its own person who made spoons, and so you would have had you know perhaps so there would have been fewer people, but there would have been much more variety and creativity going into each individual object. By its nature, the internet makes finding information easy. And, and, and I think there's an element to what bards represent, which is absent from the internet, and that's reputation and renown. Um, you know, because there's quite so much information being circulated, people, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't take anything, it doesn't cost anything to, um, to promote or to share a link or something. Whereas in days gone by, it would have really took time and effort and, and actually often quite a lot of social capital to really recommend a storyteller or recommend a craftsman. And, and so you're trading on your, own, trading on your own reputation at the time, whereas you know, that's less of a case on something like Facebook where you might post a link and it will be seen by like maybe 20 of your friends before it gets buried in the kind of mess of stuff from uh, you know, everyone else. I think the sheer mass of information is causing stuff of quality to be occluded quite often and hard to find but you know there's uh, again seeing things in two minds there's always that that slight bit of excitement when you find something despite that when you as a you know it's perhaps a bad time to be a, a storyteller but it's quite a good time to be a, a treasure hunter it's you know when you when you look at what's happening in the world there's so much pain and so much suffering and so many challenges we face individually and also collectively as humanity that it's so easy to think that the problems are so great in the world that who, who are we? We're so small, there's nothing we can do. And so you give up, you lose hope. But in this, this story is, is one of where an old man comes down to the seashore and he sees a young girl by the seashore and what she's doing is she's picking up the starfish that have got stranded on the high tide. The tide's gone out and they're, they're stranded on the sand and she's picking them up one by one, throwing them back into the water. And he asks her what she's doing and she says, um, if, they, if they don't go back into the water, they die. And he says, well, you know, why are you bothering? Because there's so many on this beach. There's no way you can get them all back into the water. It won't make a difference. And she just holds up the starfish she's holding. She says, well, it certainly makes a difference to this one. And then throws it back into the sea. And when I heard that story, those sort of, that voice of doubt that had been in me, I think up until then really saying, well, you can't really make a difference. You might have one person here, one person there. That just settled the question for me once and for all. I thought, that's, that's the approach to take. If 
You take my hand, dear And we'll go When I was small David was tall With slingshot and stone A hero to the all Tales of monsters and men And their forms Fragments of stories are burning and turning through time And that is their beauty, they're fragile, but they're mine